he did, which was a, which was hilarious. It was great. Thrown in the garbage. It's gone, man. There's no footage. There's a couple of still photos from it, but uh-huh. the footage is gone. So they can't even do like a director cut saying nothing. It, right. it is what it is at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, but it really, it was Bob's. It was Bob's vision, and Gene Shepard nudging him every single moment he could. Right, right, yeah. You know, I mean, Gene was there. Now, people have asked, what was Gene Shepard like? And I tell you, I had one conversation with the man, one. Yeah. He was standing there talking to somebody about something, and I walked over being, you know, one of his actors. I said, Gene, are you cool with everything? You're terrific, kid. You're, you're marvelous. I said, okay, thanks. And, and, and that was it. Literally, that was it. The only words he ever spoke to me. Right, right. He was worried about Peter and Ralph. He was worried about Ralphie. Uh-huh. And he would go over to Peter and say something, and 30 seconds later, Bob Clark would run over to Pete and say, I don't care what he said. Just, just don't pay any attention. Huh. you got to do it my way. Right, don't right. listen to him. you got to do it my way. It was hilarious. This went on all the time. <laughs> you know, wow. Gene would run over, and blah, 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 and, 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 and Bob would run over to Peter. What do you say? No, don't pay no attention. Just do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then, so a few minutes ago, you mentioned the toy, and of course, I'm just a huge fan of the toy, so, I mean, was that something you were just offered, or do you have to go out for an audition for that? How did that work? Oh, I did 10 or 11 auditions for that. There was no offering at that time. I mean, I went in to what, what they call a cattle call. Mm-hmm. It was me and 400 other kids. Right. And that, that was just one day in New York. They did Boston, Chicago, L.A. You know, they did casting all over the place. Uh-huh. And it was just wheedling down, wheedling down, one after another. There's less and less people. And uh, they had they come up by the time we ended up screen testing in California. There were three people. Realistically, it was two people. Uh-huh. They had a Toys R Us promotion for a Jackie Gleason lookalike contest. <laughs> so if you look like Gleason, you got to do a screen test and a free trip to Universal. <laughs> so that kid was not really an actor, and they were never really going to give him the job. They strictly did it for a promotional tool. Right, right. So when they did the screen test, it was me and Henry Thomas. Oh, wow. Me. Sure. Now, the difference between the two of us was he had done a movie I hadn't. E.T. had not come out yet. Uh-huh. So he had just done a Spielberg movie, but it wasn't out. And I had done Broadway, Off-Broadway, and, you know, 100 commercials and whatever. Sure. Um, but the differences in our personas, you know, One's over on the left, and one is over on the right. You uh-huh. know, he was much. He was always much more serious and much more, you know, down. And I was, and I was the guy jumping off the walls. You know, I was, <laughs> I was. Remember, remember in the seventies and eighties, the Super Bowls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember, you bounced and it went flying someplace. Right. That was me. <laughs> that was me. And and so they basically looked at it and said, you know, we got one kid who's up here, one kid who's down here. Well, ninety-five percent of the movie, we want this kid up here. Right. Right. And that was basically the difference in, you know, who they chose. Sure. I have to wonder, I mean, how, as a kid, though, how, how nerve-wracking for you is that, is that audition, audition process, though? The, 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 the regular auditions, nothing was nerve-wracking. The only thing that was nerve-wracking for me was waiting to hear when it was down to the end. Right. You know, when, uh, when they got down to, you know, when we left, uh, L.A., which was just before the holidays, uh-huh. you know, like December 22nd, we left L.A. Right. And, uh, of course, nothing gets done over the holidays, so here you are, and you're just sitting and thinking and thinking and whatever. And uh, January 4th, I got the call. Uh-huh. But it was that, you know, week or 10 days when just, you know, there was many nights of not too much sleep and, you know, driving myself crazy because I wanted it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and I kind of I kind of mentioned it earlier, but one of the things that I find so, you know, so beautiful about the toy is is your your range of emotion that you're able to grab. So, I mean, how did I mean, how did you find that that range of emotion that we see in the toy for that character? I mean, the happiness is the happiness, the sadness, you know, it's just trying it wasn't really drawing from anything. Mhm. And most, and, and listen, I'll be the first one to tell you, back then, when you're a young kid, there's not too much to draw from, so right. most of the tears are fake. They just take this little thing, and it's just clear, and they just blow it into your eyes, and you just cry. Okay. It's sort of, it's sort of like standing over an onion. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. And if you can just react to it and give the the emotion of it, it works. Sure, sure. You know, so I certainly didn't. I certainly didn't uh, walk around for four hours and you know, oh my god, I've got to get into this. No, I didn't do that. You know. Gotcha. And I mean, when you're a kid, are you able to see the sort of. Uh you know, adult-oriented jokes that are in the toy, and also perhaps maybe, you know, the, this racial subtext that's going on in the toy as well? None of it. No? None of it. Being honest with you, when I, when, you know, the big thing is, you know, Jack, uh, you know, Jack Brown, this was masturbates, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> Not a clue, and it was perfect. It was dead-on perfect. Now, the only place where it, 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 it doesn't work is the scene where we're at the, at the table and it's me, Gleason, Pryor, and the girl that played fancy, Teresa Ganzel. Right. We're sitting there, and in between takes, Gleason and Pryor are just going hog wild. I mean, they're just going back and forth and back and forth. And I'm sitting there, and I mean, I'm cracking up. And there's nothing you can do. I mean, these guys, are, these are the masters. Right. Well, at one point, Teresa's boob popped out of her dress. And she's sitting to my right, and Gleason is sitting to my left. And he goes, uh, honey, honey, and he looks at her, and she goes, he says, honey, um, your left is more than your right. And, of course, what are you going to do? You look, right? Right. So I look, and her boob, her boob is sticking out of her dress. So she tucks her boob back in, okay. And, of course, then Richard chimed in with something that was just hilarious. So now I'm laughing. So now that, now we're going to do the, the finale bit of the scene where he's, you know, he talks about it. He talks about the boobs getting done and the whole thing and whatever. Uh-huh. And I have to do the fancy, what did your boobs look like before line. Right. I can't keep straight. <laughs> I, can't, I can't keep straight because every time I'm doing it, Richard is just fumbling something. He's gnawing, I don't think gnawing at me, but he's just tagging on me. And I'm busting out laughing. So they've, got, they've actually got footage get on straight of me doing the line, and I can't do it. I'm cracking up. <laughs> so Richard Donner says, you know what, let's just change it, we'll do it this way. So he shoots me over the shoulder across to Richard's reaction, and you see my face, you know, I'm just, you know, side, vi- side view. Right. And I see, you know, fancy, what did your boobs look like before? And he spits the water, and I start laughing. <laughs> and that's the one they kept, because that's the, they, could, they couldn't get, there was no way to get one of me being straight, because I couldn't do it because of Richard. <laughs> Man, it's so, it's so, it's such. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Now I got you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, And then, so, you know, I've read things, obviously, that, you know, where, you know, there's a lot of improv on the toy, and, you know, Gleason was sort of difficult to work with. So, I mean... How did you, I mean, I'm assuming that, I mean, when when Jackie Gleason yells at you, right, do you give it back to him? How, I mean, how does that work? Well, that stuff never happened. There was no, ever, nobody ever yelled at me. Okay, okay. Gleason was known to be rough. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. When I was introduced to him, we had a meeting before we started shooting, and I hadn't met him yet. And I was a big Gleason nut. I knew, I knew the Honeymooners, but I was a huge Smoking the Bandit fanatic. So uh-huh. I knew every line every inflection, everything he did. Sure. So I did it for the director, for Richard Donner. Right. So we get, we get and we sit down at, at Gleason's, you know, table at the hotel. And even, not even hello, Richard Donner says to me, yes, yeah, Scotty, get up and do that smoky thing that you did for me in the office. So I get, listen, director says something, I do it. I don't even think. Right. I'm five, I'm four foot five, probably uh-huh. 50 pounds. And I walked over to Gleason and I'm still shorter than he is. Uh-huh. And I looked at him and I go, there's no way no way that you could come from my loins. <laughs> First thing we do when we get home is punch your mama in the mouth. <laughs> well, that started it. Now, I had to do 10 minutes of movie. Right. Because Gleason's like, keep going. Because he wanted to see if he could push me. Sure. No problem. Let's go. Okay. And I went into all the bits. Uh-huh. But he loved it. So what, what that showed him was I knew who he was. Uh-huh. I was a fan of his work. Right. But, you know, impression is the highest form of flattery. Sure, sure. So here he's got this 14-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid, who he can mold. Uh-huh. So he talked to me all the time. We were off the set. On the set, he's talking to me. Going to his trailer, we talk about things. And so he treated me way far beyond 
what anybody ever thought he would treat me like. They figured he's going to treat me like shit because I'm a kid. Right. But I didn't have the mindset of a kid. Right, right. So, so and that was Gleason. Richard Pryor, greatest human being to ever walked the planet. Can't tell you how much he did for me. You know, you talk about ad living. <clears throat> I was on the set two weeks, and I was ad living with him. Right, right, yeah. Because, because Richard told me, he said, hey, listen, who gives a shit what the hell is on the fucking script? Who cares? Just say something close. It don't matter. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And you may, you maintained a relationship with him long after that, that show was over, right? I was with him from that point until he passed. I saw him. The last time I saw him was about about two months before he passed, and I felt bad because a couple times I was going to go see him, and then it was an audition, and I had to run here and go there and whatever. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I just didn't end up getting back to, to, to see him before he passed. But, you know, you know, friends, you know, that would be the understatement of a decade. Sure. And, you know, he was, he was the second dad. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? You know, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, what do you think? What, what, what do you think was one of the things you learned from him while you were with him? Oh God, everything. Yeah. Timing, timing. You know, uh, uh, reactions. Uh, you know, just it's funny you can't really put it into words more than that. Sure. It was just everything. You know, being comfortable on a set. I've never been on a movie set with a hundred and some people in a crew. Uh huh. Yeah, you do commercials. Yeah, I get 15, 20 people hanging around. All right, fine, whatever. There's 140 people on this thing. Right, right. You know, yeah. and, they're, and they're all looking at you going, we do understand we have Gleason and Pryor, but you're the third wheel here, dude. You've got to make this shit run. Right. <laughs> you know, so what, I mean, what it did was it gave me a humongous amount of confidence. Okay, you know, gotcha. The, the confidence I had when I finished that, you know, I don't think there was probably another kid who had a bigger ego at that point than I did. Because I stood, I stood toe-to-toe with Gleason and Pryor for right. four months. Right, right, right. And that's just not something everybody could do. And I knew that, which leads to um, shooting Kid Co., right. which was hysterical. Yeah. I yeah. get home. I get home from shooting the toy, and within two weeks, I'm already going up for Kid Co. Mm-hmm. Took them basically three auditions. They knew they wanted me right away. So now I'm auditioning other sisters, you know, all the different combinations, who they're going to pick to be the sisters. Right, right. And uh, come shooting time, they had a 10-week shooting schedule, or a nine-and-a-half-week shooting schedule. And and me, because, again, you know, you have to understand the time and the place, you know, I'm I'm out of hand at this point, but I'm out of hand in a good way. Uh Uh-huh. So they were supposed to finish shooting, like, December 20th. Well, December 10th, the toy opened in the movie theaters. Uh-huh. I, I can't be shooting until December 20th. Are you crazy? So we do a table reading of everybody. Everybody's at the table reading. My dad, the producers, directors, all the cast members, whatever. We get done with that, and I said to the director, listen, I'd like to have a meeting with you and, the, the, you know, and Frankie Blonde and David Niven Jr., my dad, you know, the first AD. This is me now. I'm 14 years old, and I'm calling, I'm calling a crew meeting. <laughs> so... We're sitting at the table, and uh, I said, listen, the shooting schedule doesn't work for me. I have to be done by December 10th because the toy opens in the theaters, and I have promotion to do. Uh-huh. They all looked at me. First of all, the jaws dropped to the ground. Then they looked at me, and they go, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> they, throw, they throw me out of the room, and they got my dad in the room. Uh-huh. And they look at my dad, and they said, did we just completely screw the pooch here? What, what's up with your kid? Is he just crazy? And my father says, you don't understand. He just got off shooting four months with Gleason and Pryor. My kid is a monster right now. You get on his shoulders, no, you get on his shoulders, and he will take you to the finish line. Right, right. And, and they're still <laughs> scratching their heads. And they're like, right, wait a minute, now the kid has said it. Now the father is saying it. Something's got to be up here. So they bring me back in the room. They said, listen, this is the shooting schedule that we have. And I said, that's great. You want me to meet with the first AD? We'll redo the shooting schedule. I'll be ready to go any scene, any time, any place. Let's go. <laughs> so, David, between David Niven Jr., Frank Lawrence, and Ron Maxwell, the director, they had over 100 years of experience. They had never seen this, and they told us that. Wow. You know, at, the, at the rap party, they told us. So we proceeded to shoot, and scenes that they thought were going to take full days were taking half days. Why? Because I knew what the fuck I was doing. I was ready to go. Uh-huh. 